Joining us is a sister uh, of ours uh, who I met in Nubia uh, because we have these things. Uh, well, not we. Dr. Greg Carr does an office hours on Mondays, right? Where it started out just talking with folk because, you know, he has, he's in a different mood than in class with Carr. And it's just like, hi, right, let's, what y'all want to talk about? And people will pop in and have different things that they want to converse about. Dr. Jerry was in, we had her on last week. And I was like, man, these people got some stories and they done, 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 did some things. And Tasha's been in a few times and I'm like, this woman, we need we need to really sit with her. And I think she's going to end up doing a course in Nubia. So I'm looking forward to this, but I wanted to have her on to talk about a bunch of stuff. So let me welcome, of course, incoming assistant professor of teacher education, languages, education, and multilingualism for the University of Buffalo Graduate School of Education. She's also, of course, a master teacher educator to uh, quote Jane Elliott, Dr. Tasha Austin. Hi, welcome. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate you bringing me on. It's so good to be in conversation with you. I feel like I'm in conversation with you as a Nubian, but not directly. So this is this is dope. I know I'm I'm usually lurking on office hours because I'm like, that's his space. I don't want to be, you know, unless I pop in. But for the most part, I'm in the chat starting trouble. And uh, that's where I like to be. It's my time to put my hair down. But I'm fascinated. I've been trying for the last three years to learn Spanish because I feel like um, that and Chinese will be two languages that we gonna have to learn uh, for our self-preservation, especially if we got to dip out somewhere. And then I'm like, when I get to the continent, of course, there's like a hundred languages that we got to learn and uh, dialects and things. But you are like a master linguist. And I wanted to, before Drew was asking you some questions, we're going to get to those in a, in a minute. But what was your introduction into languages and how many languages can you speak fluently? Yeah, so uh, linguists would absolutely not claim me. Uh, so as a language educator, there was a, there's a text that talks about linguistic imperialism that kind of traced when linguistics splintered off to linguists versus everybody else who studies or is a researcher of languages. So that was a very strategic move. Okay, over- well, educate me because I, yeah. I use that with a certain understanding and I'm clearly not I don't know what I'm talking about. So tell me. Yeah. So, you know, as, as a part of really imperialism and, and really the splintering of power from Western Europe around the world, there's very strategic decision. Uh, one of the conferences, you know, over in the UK, I said, hey, you know what? We got to rein this thing in. We can't have everybody having command over what's considered linguistics, right? So let's say linguistics and then let's say applied linguistics. And that was a way to kind of demarcate and bring to a lower status anyone who's studying language that's not disembodied from the actual humans who are using the language. So then, you know, linguists, there's a big chasm in the field about who's a linguist and versus who's a sociolinguist or who's a ratiolinguist. And they've got all these prefixes to kind of remove and to lower the status of folks who refuse to separate the practice of languaging from the bodies who enact it. So I definitely fall on the the side of, you know, you're not a true linguist, you know, you're just studying the way actual humans use the language. I'm definitely on that side of things. So interesting. So do you speak different languages? <laughs> I just, she's like, is it languages? Yes. Well, yeah. No, I do. I, I'm fluent in Spanish and English. And I studied uh, Latin for several years and beginning meta nature, right? Um, but I have what they call receptive bilingualism um, across Romance languages because of my level of, I guess you could say, expertise in Spanish. I lived in Spain and taught Spanish for nine years. Um, And so what happens is receptive bilingualism speaks to your ability to interpret what you're getting in that language, but then you respond maybe in in a different language. So if you were to speak to me in Italian, I could speak back to you in Spanish or English. You know, if you were to speak to me in Portuguese, likely the same French is a little bit stickier. I can read French very well, but in terms of actually, you know, kind of interpreting it auditorily is a little bit more challenging because their system, their phonetic system is very different. Yeah. Fascinating. So Dr. Dr. Austin, so what was it high school Spanish? Because I remember being in high school Spanish and um, get kicked out a lot. Uh, Mrs. Puente Dewani would kick me out all the time because I was in the back um, having fun. That was me, class clown. 
just Karen Hunter, get out. And I'll be like, okay. <laughs> um, so I, it di- I didn't, I didn't absorb it. You know, even though we did go to Spain um, junior year, I went to Spain and France, uh, a school trip, uh, had a lot of fun, but everybody spoke English. So it was like, like, like I had to be immersed. What was it for you that made you want to immerse yourself in Spanish in particular? Yeah, that's amazing. First of all, that you were abroad in high school. That's amazing. Yeah. That's- I, I want to say that it was wasted on a 16 year old. I feel like, yes, m- my 16 year old self was not evolved enough to appreciate going to the Louvre, going to uh, Castilian, you know, when he do the clapping and, the t- <laughs> and, you know, everybody drinking wine. I, I wasn't evolved enough to really absorb the art, the, the, the culture and to see African. Like I didn't know my African self enough to see myself in all of these places because we were there. We, we, we existed. So I'm like, it's sometimes this, this, this knowledge is wasted on on folk who are not in a space where they can absorb it enough to then put it back out you know it's like digest it and then put it back out so people can also want to know it so for you what was the entry point so that's my fight that that name you dropped I said go ahead drop the names name all the names they threw you out of class they should have been making (laughs) the learning so incredible that you could not resist it but anyway Um, to throw you out of class, that, that's why you think you were not evolved enough. You are absolutely evolved enough, right? But you just need to be prepared. And that is the job of a language educator. So that is my fight. So now you got me, you got me ready to go. But, but my own entry point, um, you know, I came up in Hudson County. So I came up, you know, in the shadow of Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty, all the things. And um, Jersey City rivals New York every year for like the most diverse on the on the planet, right? And so I came up with folks in my classes who they were from countries I didn't know existed. Um, And that was the norm. Um, You didn't know who you were in the presence of until deep into your your time spent with them because you might think that they were black and they were Dominican. You might think that they were, you know, um, from India and they were Guyanese. So over time in a beautiful context like that, you really come to have this deep fascination appreciation, interest in cultures and languages. And so uh, the pain of my journey is that that never was directed inward. So I always wanted to know about languages and cultures, but through US public schooling, as a black American, you're made to think that is other. Other people have languages and other people have culture, right? And you similar, right, to, I guess you could say, white Americans, you might not think you have any of that, but as a white American, you would typically say, yes, I'm just normal. But as a black American, you're kind of made to believe that you're just void of these cultural things, right? That's, that's what those folks have. I'm just, I'm just black, right? So that was very much the experience coming up. And so as much as I was interested in languages and cultures, I never really thought to turn it inward. And so for the particular area that I came up in, it was predominantly Puerto Rican and Dominican. And so most of my friends from the music, from the dancing, from the food, from the religious, you know, all the things, it was all in Spanish. So it was a very kind of expected, I don't want to say natural because it's definitely socially derived, but an expected end for me to get an interest in Spanish, the language and the culture. Um, But it wasn't cultivated. Like I had to fight for it. I had to fight for it in high school where they said, no, you can't go to Spanish three. You're not a native. And they just denied me. I had a perfect average. No, you can't. It was, it was a fight. Yeah, it was a fight in college. I got to college and they said, well, this is multi-pronged, right? I got to college and if you take entrance exams in languages, usually the variety of the language that they'll present to you is the imperial variety. So my entrance exam was given to me in Castilian Spanish, so Spanish from Spain. So mm. everything that I would, you, you, you know me, yeah. Drew. Yeah, I know that. So everything I was used to hearing, I was like, hmm. And the whole like uh, context of when I was supposed to interpret to answer the question was about un coche, un coche, un coche. And if you're around Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, es un carro. Nunca se dice un coche. Like, what is a coche? Coche What is is un coche, yeah. A coche is a baby carriage. So I'm supposed to interpret this entire story about the car. And I'm like, that don't make sense. So, you know, getting into college, they were like, well, you didn't make the language cut off. So I had to go petition the dean, do a full presentation to plead my case to be able to travel abroad. So it's been a fight every step of the way, uh, only to get to my doctoral studies and 
begin to write a paper and they're like, well, why are you interested in languages? And I'm like, well, you know, because I'm interested in the cultural. And I just, I had an epiphany, like I was looking outside when I could have been looking inside this whole time. Mm. And from there, I've just like, I've been nonstop because now I'm like, oh no, we got to fix this. I love the fact that your doctoral work brought that out for you. Like that, that, that feels like, well, that's why you become a doctor, right? Like that, that's that next level. Like you hit into the, into the, the next realm of like understanding when, um, when you were talking about the difference and the nuances of, of language, de depending upon like how you hear it or whatever. Um, my ex is Dominican and I would always ask him, I was like, why are you struggling with what this person is saying? It was like Mexican people speak Spanish differently than people from, from Spain, than people from Dominican. It was like, it was like my Mexican Spanish sucks. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I, I always wonder that for my friends who are like my, the friends of my, the ones of my boys that we all travel together, the one, the, the guys who actually speak Spanish, because we spend a lot of time in the Caribbean and we spend a lot of time in Latin America um, and, you know, less time in, in Europe now that we're older, like we would just depend on them the whole time. It's like, yo, what are we doing? Because all I know is how to ask for the Wi-Fi, right? Like, where's the Wi-Fi? What, give me the code, right? Um <laughs> But like traveling with other people makes you so lazy as it relates to, to, to mm -hmm. language. Where have you been where you were using Spanish or you were using your ability to interpret romance languages where you felt the most like, not fluent, but also just like communal, like part of the, the, the global, like a global citizen where? I had to tell you, my one of my biggest fights is that, you know, we travel the globe for something that we have right here at home. And I really, I have an issue with the way that we depict studying world languages, particularly in K-12 spaces, because what you're saying to this young child who's maybe from, you know, a lower SES is like, if you don't have the funds to travel for pleasure, and if you're not going to open a business and use the business language of French, like this is not for you. And we say that so early that we really cut off a large amount of the population who already has the linguistic prowess to, yeah. number one, become the next generation of language teachers, but to number two, just affirm who you are. And so for me, like when I think about communal use of, of language, most of it has actually been at home. So like I've wow. lived, I lived in Spain for a year, you know, I've traveled to Puerto Rico, I've traveled to Mexico, you know, but in terms of feeling like Blackness is in the way that I'm languaging, which there's an incredible book that really turned me on to this. It's uh, Speaking Blackness in Brazil. And I know off, off air, you were talking about Brazil and I was holding myself together. Karen, I didn't talk about the Brazil thing until we came back on. Are we going to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that text, Speaking Blackness in Brazil by Dr. Uju Anya, who is a polyglot, I think six or seven languages fluently. She's half Trinidadian, I believe, and half Nigerian. But she followed five, I believe, of her study abroad students. She took them every year to Brazil. And they were all Black students, all African-American students. And just looking through their eyes at the experience of how they came to know themselves because they were in this Black country mm -hmm. as they were studying Portuguese, I was just like, resentment doesn't even cover it. Meanwhile, I'm over here in Spain and they're trying to prick me up, pick me up as a sex worker. Mm -hmm. I'm in Spain at 19 years old and they're chasing me out of the, the, the subway station saying, you can't sell your stuff here. This is the experience I'm having at 19 yeah. because the languages typically that are centered are white varieties of imperial languages. So you know, me being downtown Jersey City, like at a quinceanera dancing bachata or something is the most communal I felt sure. using Spanish, you know, not when I was abroad at all. You know, this is interesting you say that because I know for me, um, I wasted a lot of my parents' money um, doing study abroad when I was at Morehouse. I was in Nice for a summer, but it was when I got to Martinique that I really gave a shit. Like I was traveling with my, with my best friend when we were in Nice and I was like, he's fluent. I'm good. Like, I just need to know how to order, how to order some beer and some drinks. 
um, and to holler at these dudes. And it wasn't that many to holler at anyway. And so, um, but then I got to Martinique and I was like, yo, okay, everybody's black. Let me, let me dig in, right? Like everybody, I'm at the post office and people are, and, and everybody's black and I'm trying to send my letters. Like I really didn't really dig in to, to, to French until I got to Fort de France. And it was a game changer for me. I got home and didn't use it because I came, flew back home to Atlanta and with nobody speaking French, nowhere that I could go to, that I could see. But I feel you on that in that language is so accessible to us if we actually use it, particularly when we're younger. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't wanna you know, fly in the face of literature or whatever, but please don't ever limit yourself and think that you've hit some special age where it's not gonna mm -hmm. happen. That's absolutely false, right? It is about the utility of it. It is about the opportunities for it. It is about, you know, realizing and self-actualizing in these different spaces. The same way you said, well, now I have a purpose. Yeah. Right. That will drive the way that you approach language learning. And particularly when it's removed from these cold institutional nationalistic settings that are really instead of using language for what it is which is a communicative tool to kind of kind of bring the whole of your your ancestry and your life and world views with you to a particular context and have exchanges instead of using it like that within the institutional context you know language is used as like just an extension of the nationalizing arm which is to push propaganda right about hierarchies of people we call it world languages and it's only languages of western europe Western plus, Europe, right? Plus China and Japan sometimes, right? So how is it a yeah. world language? And you're really talking about a handful of white Western countries. Come on. It's that not didn't even, even start everything. Uh, but yet we're standing here speaking English. Uh, 866-801-8255. Dr. Tasha Austin is here. We're talking more than languages. Drew McCaskill's here as well. I want to welcome in Lindsay. Lindsay Smith, who was usually behind the cameras directing things, but she had a question. So pop in. Hi. Hi, hi, Tasha. Um, so I was thinking about everything that you're saying. I'm learning Spanish now. It's a little slower. I have a Spanish teacher who is American with Nigerian parents. He lives in Bolivia and his primary work is to preserve the languages, the local languages throughout Bolivia, Peru, also Brazil. And he was speaking to us and you've touched on this, but I'm just was struck by what he said that you'll go to a lot of these rural communities and places where he's meant to preserve the language and the culture and the history, but we'll find that there's no like running water. And so that will become the project. So he teaches us Spanish so that he can get running water because that is just simply a more dire need than preserving the language of an entire people in an instant in a day. Um, and at the same time, he was telling us that a lot of the folks there feel this kind of shame about having an attachment to their local language and are will defer immediately to the colonizer's language in this case spanish which is a perfectly fine language but like there are a lot of pockets of local languages that are getting lost and they'll drink starbucks coffee for example and not like the local coffee beans all to be separate from that so i'm just i'm one i would love to hear you talk more about this because i think sometimes when we think about mexican spanish being different from dominican spanish being different from spanish spoken in spain and people will characterize it as, oh, that's hard to under understand, or this is bad Spanish. They think that that's kind of just some thing to say, but like hearing my teacher talk about people's behaviors and shame of their roots in their home countries because of it, you don't, we don't all see that because we're, we're on Zoom right now. We're not all in Bolivia actually seeing yeah. that. Um, and I had a second question about Latin, but maybe I'll just stop here. <laughs> all right. she, and she came in talking about Salwe Magistra. Salwe! Oh. <laughs> I love it. Right. Can I come in TV? I love it. I love it. Yeah. Dead um, language. Dead language. Okay. Good. Yeah. But listen, so, okay, here's what's interesting about um, what you shared, Lindsay. I think we know intimately what's happening with your Spanish teacher, but we don't make the connections. And I really do place a heavy part of that blame on the school system and the way we, we learn all languages because English is a world language. So if we start right there, you can think about how we're, we're groomed to believe that certain languages stand apart and above from everything else. You take English and then maybe if you have the right advocacy and access, maybe you could take a world language later. And that world only includes the Western empire, right? So it starts right there. And when you think about 
wow, what must it be like to like have this indigenous way of just preserving who you are and, and like, you know, heritage and all of that and to feel ashamed of it. I know that that is very much the case as a black American, people don't really compare it that way, right? Because we put English over there and we put world languages over here, but that's ideology that separates them. These are all world languages. So if we think about the fact of how many of us code switch, that is linguistic shame, right? That's a part mm -hmm. of us. Now, my argument to kind of counter that is sometimes we're just intentionally being in a space the way we want to show up in a space, right? It's not always, I'm so ashamed of the way that I language my life. Sometimes it's like, this is where I'm putting up this barrier and this is all you're getting from me. And I recognize that. But in terms of a legitimate belief that you can't access jobs, you can't access housing, you can't access degrees and credentialing, all based on the way that you choose to language your existence, that is linguistic shame. Hmm. And we're, we're groomed to carry that, even though many of us resist and subvert in really brilliant ways, but we're, we're kind of like brought up in the institutional setting to carry that same shame. Only difference being, as Karen already pointed out, we speak the colonizer's language to an extent, which means that you know our ability to navigate in the colonizer's language doesn't necessarily prevent us from access maybe the same way as those smaller, more rural Bolivian indigenous, because I guess they wouldn't even be using the word Bolivian if it were them, um, communities. Facts, facts. Yeah. Um, and that leads to the the tweet that you posted uh, that Drew was talking. Thank you, Lindsay, for that. 866-801-8255. Uh, Dr. Tasha Austin is here, you know, and as you're, as you're laying this out, I'm, I've been, um, you know, since I was in college playing with language, I've had the um, the brother that teaches Gullah Geechee at Harvard, which is hilarious to me. Um, you know, my, my my mother, my grandfather was Gullah Geechee. You know, there's a whole language. And then you, you have the diaspora of Creole Patois in Jamaica, where we on plantations had to figure out how to communicate in a tongue that was not taught to us. They didn't teach us the subject verb agreement, syntax, all of that. We weren't, we were, uh, it was legal to read, illegal to write, right? So, so the way in which we took a language and shifted it, um, much the way the Latin language, the Romans took whatever, you know, isn't that what everyone has done, you know, from place to place to place is take a language and twist it and make their, make it their own. Even Portuguese is a, I think a bastardized version of something else that came before it. And this is just what human beings do. They adapt. Um, but yet you're, you're saying they attach shame to it because if you don't speak it this way and that Castilian lispy bull crap, um, I, I was taught that Colombians speak the most perfect Spanish, not the Spanish, which I think is interesting as well. But uh, Dr. Austin, what, what, what do you say about that? I, I think it's really funny about like the, the battle of who's the most perfect particular in the era of Francia Marquez, where it's like, oh, you thought you were shifting from one white nation to another, but surprise, like Colombia's black. Um, so I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> That's what you get, right? Like that is the subversion of it all. That's what you get. The more you try to suppress a people, the more you try to subjugate them, like the brilliance of the way that we're able to navigate and use fugitive practices, not just to survive, but to always be ahead is just beautiful. Um, but in terms of like the the belief that, you know, like the, like it's not a list that they have. There's a real reason that they do that. They take it from the Greek and the theta and there's a reason they, you know, so there's a reason that they- Wait, Can we, can we, oh, wait, wait, before you finish. <laughs> I have a, 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 a dear friend now who's from Egypt and the the amount of words that are in Arabic that are also in Spanish, because the Arabic came first and they conquered and dominated the way the Moors did and way before that, the Carthage. Anyway, I don't want to talk about Africans' domination of Italy and all Spain and everything. But yes, there was that. Uh, it's interesting to me. So is there Spanish without Arabic? No, not in the way that we know it. Not at oh, all in the way that we know it. to clear it. that up, y'all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm -hmm. well, so the that. funny thing is like, I feel like teaching, educating has driven me to all of these um, epiphanies, right? Like I said, I'm not the traditionally trained linguist, but I have a lot of insights and approaches to language teaching and research that a lot of trained linguists would never 
take, but it's from experience, right? It's a very bell hooks kind of approach from, from my actual work in the classroom. That's where I develop theories. And then I research them to see if there's any merit to them. And what you're talking about, about the Arabic influence, you know, I lived in Spain and I was in the South of Spain and the flamenco, the castanuela, all of that good stuff. But not did it occur to me the way that that influence permeates linguistically until I was teaching in Jersey City. Why? Huge Egyptian population. You're sitting in a class of 30 plus students. And as a good educator, right? Not because I'm like, you know, some academy trained linguist, but as a good educator, this is a decade ago, you have Egyptian students who are not proficient yet in English, but who are sitting in your Spanish class. And so the goal then becomes, why do they care? The goal then becomes, what is the point of connection that I can leverage to ensure that this is accessible and meaningful for them? Because frankly, if I don't have a purpose for doing, like English is going to take precedent, right? We know we're in an English predominantly speaking country. So I'm in the Spanish class, yeah, whatever. I have things to do. I'm gonna turn my brain off until I get back into math or ELA. And so what I began to do was to look for those connections and sure enough, it wasn't just connections, it was everything. It was 800 years of the Moors having had reign over the entirety of the Iberian Peninsula. And furthermore, it, it was in the architecture, it was in the language. Everywhere you looked, it was like they put lipstick on mosques and called them cathedrals. Like they didn't even yeah. really, because everything was so beautiful and advanced, even their wanting to erase the influence of North Africans, they couldn't bear to do it because it was too incredible. And so they put a stained glass window and kept it pumping. Like they didn't even try to seriously uproot the beauty of what the North African folks left there because it was just too amazing. And so my lessons ended up coming from posting images and showing the music, right? You're listen to the vocalizations. Listen to the vocalizations of those uh southern Spaniards, right? They don't want to tell you they're <laughs> Romani nomadic people. No, the southern Spaniards, right? And you end up finding that this everything that they love, I know it's going to sound familiar in a minute. Everything that they love about being Spaniards is not about Spain. It's African. It's right. African. <laughs> right. So, uh, Dr. Tasha, let me ask you this. Um, I'm thinking about the next the I, I know you said that we all can that we all can learn a language, but I'm also thinking about the next generation of young folks. Right. Like, how do we make that connection for them for if they are learning Spanish or if they are learning Portuguese or they are learning um, French or they are learning of these other languages? How do we make that connection for them that? I didn't get in Nice, I got in Martinique. Like, how do we get that for them so that when they're listening for it, they make the connection to the diaspora? Because I feel like language is another one of those ways that if we really connected linguistically, that our connection to the diaspora would shift and change almost miraculously. Beloved, that's it. <laughs> that's it that's really my fight right at the end of the day like I'm, I'm going about it in a research academic way right I've published mm -hmm. papers about anti-blackness and language curricula I've mm -hmm. published about you know um eradicating linguistic imperialism and anti-blackness and world language teacher preparation so I'm, I'm pushing in that way but we know those mm -hmm. papers get circulated among a few people there's 42 dollars if you want to download it as a lay person Right, it's, it's not really what's doing the work. So my work is in preparing those who will teach those babies, but also in the work that I do with my own child. It's also in the way that I show up in the world, right? And it's in the way that I push for across education for us to stop restricting all the multimodal extra linguistic representations of black people around the world. So what I mean by that is if we take it back to what Karen said about all these restrictions, you can't read, you can't write, you can't do this. It's all purposeful. It's all about maintaining the racial hierarchy, yeah. but we are brilliant, right? And so, so much of what we communicated was extra linguistic. It was yeah. beyond the language. You know, I think about Chris Smalls and how he doesn't have to say a thing. Look at how he shows up in the world, right? Look at what he's wearing. This is how he shows up and he's giving you a whole message 
with his mouth closed. I think back to Francia Marquez mm -hmm. as well. There's a reason that she shows up in the kente cloth the way that she does. We are telling messages through our hair, through our fashion, through our dance, through our media. Through There's so many ways that we're getting the job done. My fight in the, in the small space that I'm in is get out the way. Like my argument is I'm not asking you to do anything extra on behalf of black folks. What I'm saying is stop misrepresenting the world as it is. Yeah. The world is black. You're just yeah. misrepresenting it.